podcast tomorrow morning. And uh, that's it. So we can give our full attention. So I heard this story. There was a couple in an apartment. I'm just going to say in Israel, because those are just a fun way to throw it in there. But let's just say in an apartment, apartment building, and they have neighbors on either side of them. And one day, the wife turns to the husband and says, you know, the walls between our apartment and the neighbor's apartment are really, really thin. And the neighbors could hear everything we're saying. Let's get thicker walls, you know, put in some soundproofing in there. And the husband says, no, nonsense. They can't hear anything. The walls are plenty thick enough. There's no need for that. And they're talking back and forth and they're discussing back and forth. And then they're fighting back and forth. And it's like escalating. And she's like, no, we got to get those walls. And he's like, absolutely not. There's no need. The neighbors can't hear anything. And then they hear a knock on the door and they open the door and it's the next door neighbor. And the neighbor says, I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. I just wanted to let you know that there's no need to reinforce the walls or get any kind of soundproofing because we cannot hear a word you're saying next door. <laughs> okay. So, so what <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's funny because obviously if he's knocking on the door saying you don't need to reinforce the walls, that's the biggest reason that you know you have to reinforce the walls. So my comparison for Parsha's Truma is you open up a Parsha like Truma and you're coming from such amazing, rich Parshas like Mishpatim and Yisra where so much was happening. All of the, so many commandments were given so many things we could relate to and bring into our lives. And then we open up Truma and it's, it's so technical. And not only is it technical, it's technical about things which unfortunately are not relevant to us in, in 2022. It's talking about how the Jewish people built the Mishkan in the desert and we don't have a Mishkan and we don't have a base of Mikdash. So all of these details seem to be so irrelevant now. But I say, if the Yetzirah is saying that Parsha's Truma is not relevant and there aren't lessons to be learned, then that is exactly how you know that there's golden, golden content in the Parsha that can enrich our lives and that can impact us in such a tremendous way. So whenever we hear the Eight Sahara say, nah, it's meaningless what you're doing, what's the point? It's only a small act, there's not so much reward. You know, that's how you know that the stakes are high. So if the Eight Sahara is gonna tell me that Truma is going to be hard to find something worth sharing, I tell you that that's exactly how I know that there's so much amazing, uh, amazing lessons that we can take out of the Parsha. So there's all the different parts of the Mishkan are taught about. We build the Mishkan. Let's just first get into what is the Mishkan. The Mishkan, the, Mishkan, the tabernacle, its purpose was to ground our spiritual connection with Hashem into something physical. And we came off of this unbelievable high at Mount Sinai, and then unfortunately went to this incredible low at the, the golden calf. And uh, there's a need to create something physical in our Judaism and our spiritual connection to Hashem that we can rally around. You know, now, you can accurately say that an integral part of Jewish life is the synagogue because we rally around the synagogue. This is the central focus. That's where we go. We connect, we study Torah, we learn, we try to become better Jews and, and living our lives revolved around that is a very powerful way to hang on to our connection. And somebody who doesn't have a synagogue connection is going to have a harder time, you know, grounding their Jewish connection into something real. So the Jewish people could not wait for the Beit HaMikdash. They couldn't wait another several decades until they would enter the land of Israel and have the opportunity to build the Beit HaMikdash, which of course can only be done in the right spot in Jerusalem. And therefore the instructions were make something now. The divine presence is gonna rest amongst you, amongst the camp of Israel right now. And that will be portable. That'll be something that we'll take around with us. We'll take through our years in the desert and we'll finally bring into the land of Israel. So the Mishkan was in, in a really important part of how we held on to our connection. And then in the Mishkan, there were, and around the Mishkan, there were all kinds of other artifacts. Um, so we're not gonna get into all of them, but the ones that we do get into, we're gonna try to take out a lesson that we can learn from it. We're gonna try to take a concept that is so uh, theoretical 
in our day and age and see what we can learn and what we can take home from this. So let's start with the very first one, and that is the building of the actual tabernacle, the Mishkan, where the presence of Hashem is to rest. So I'm going to read for you. We're, we're pretty close to the beginning of, of the Torah portion here in Truma, uh, chapter 25, verse 10. And uh, the Torah teaches us, the Asu Aron Atse Shitim, they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall cover it with pure gold from within and from without shall you cover it, and you should make it, uh, you should make on it a gold crown all around. Okay, so before I read on, and again, we're in chapter 25, verse 10 and 11, and, and et cetera, I want to point out the terminology that's being used here and why it is unusual. In all of the instructions of everything that was built, there was the table, there was the menorah, there was the altar, everything that was built, the instructions were given to one person, Moshe. Hashem told Moshe, these are the instructions that you should follow in the building of the temple, uh, in the building of all these items. But when it comes to the, to the Mishkan, that first word in verse 10, the asu aron, they shall make an ark, is in the plural. It doesn't say you shall, it says they shall, which is, which is highly out of place considering the rest of them had always said you shall. Not only that, when it comes to the technical parts of building the Mishkan, the accessories for the Mishkan, which starts in verse 12, it switches back to the singular. And it says, you shall cast for it four rings of gold, place them in its four corners, two rings on, on its one side and two on the other side. And then verse 13 as well, you shall make staves of acacia wood and cover them with gold, et cetera, et cetera. So this question is asked by one of my go-to favorites, the Ar HaChayim, and he says, why is this in plural and everything else is in singular? And he says, the Mishkan held the luchos, the tablets. The tablets represented the Torah. They were, what was written on the tablets was the Ten Commandments. And yes, of course, the Ten Commandments is not the entirety of Torah, but it's the basis and most fundamental part of it. And so therefore, the luchos, which are held in this Aron, in this Ark, were yeah, this is the Aron. Sorry, just in case I wasn't clear before. The Mishkan was the general term, and, in, and inside there, there was the Aron, and that's where the Luchas were kept. So the Luchos represent Torah. Says the Arachayim, perhaps Hashem was hinting to Moshe to say that the Torah is not something that can be done on an individual basis. The Torah is something that can only be fulfilled by the entire Jewish nation collectively. And the reason for that, says the Archaim, is because there are mitzvahs that not everybody could perform. There is no human being on this planet who can perform all of the mitzvahs in the Torah. For example, a Kohen. A Kohen can do a lot of mitzvahs. A Kohen can even do the mitzvahs that are unique to a Kohen of service in the temple and the sacrifices. But there's a mitzvah to give gifts to a Kohen. A Kohen's not giving himself gifts. There's a mitzvah to have a Kohen redeem your firstborn, but a Kohen himself is exempt from redeeming the firstborn. So a Kohen can't do everything. A Levi as well. He can't do the sacrifices in the temple and he can't redeem the firstborn either. Only a Yisrael could redeem the firstborn. And of course a Yisrael, well, they can't do all the sacrifices in the temple. So everybody's got something which they are not able to do. And the message here is to tell us that the Aron, which represents the Torah, can only be filled by the entire Jewish people collectively. So the Archaim says, okay, if that's the case, why is it that when it comes to the accessories of the Ark, all of a sudden we switch back to the singular? What's up with that? So he explains the instruments of the Torah is those, in our, in our example here, is those who study and toil in Torah, and those who provide the physical and financial resources to enable others to study Torah. That could be accomplished by any singular person. Nobody needs to be wait to be called upon and say, oh, you, you qualify to learn Torah or you qualify to support Torah. On the contrary, every Jew has the opportunity to wake up, to get up and to go after the Torah and to go actively help support the Torah. And that's not something we need to do collectively, but rather anybody can jump at the opportunity to take. And the Archaim re references another verse at the end of 
actually in the middle of the Parsha of Pekude, which is all, way, all the way at the end of Exodus, the end of Shemos, the very last Parsha is Pekude. And the Pasuk says, Vatechal kol avodas mishkan, ohel moed, vayasu b'nei Yisrael kechol asher tziv Hashem as Moshe kenasu. Thus was completed. This is when they finally finished building all of the Mishkan. Thus was completed all of the work of the Mishkan. The children of Israel did all that Hashem had commanded Moshe, so they did. The Jewish people fulfilled Hashem's requirements for the building of the Mishkan based on the way Hashem told Moshe. You know who could have been very offended by this statement? A fine man named Betzalel. Betzalel is the one with a team of craftsmen who actually built the Mishkan. The Jewish people did not build the Mishkan. It was Betzalel who was leading a very unique hand-selected group of people who had the talents to do this kind of physical labor of art, of, of building everything. They're the ones who built the Mishkan. Why is the Torah giving credit to the entire Jewish people? So the Arachayim says that the Torah is teaching us that we have this communal bond between all Jews regarding the fulfillment of the Torah. And even though we don't all have the opportunity to fulfill everything, when our brothers and sisters step in and fulfill the things that we can't fulfill, we collectively are fulfilling the Torah and we all get the reward for that. And the Rechaim says, Kol echad yase beyada. Every, each person does according to his capacity, the yizku zelaza, and then they merit to share the reward with one another. And he takes this a step further. We're going to take this a couple steps further. So he says, that explains the commandment of the ahafta l'reyacha kamocha. You shall love your fellow as yourself. He said, maybe another way of reading this is you shall love your fellow because he is as, as yourself. He, it's as if he is yourself. Meaning to say, another person's well-being and health and ability to do mitzvahs is you, because we are all one unit in the fulfillment of mitzvos. And if another person can't go ahead and do his mitzvos, then we're not going to reach the level of spiritual completion that we want to on our own. So love him because you're all one. We're all one Jewish people. So that's why we're loving somebody else actually as if they were us. So that's the idea of the haftoriach kamocha. And uh, another part of this, uh, which is based, based off a, a very important idea, which is you know, maybe somewhat Kabbalistic, but, but very fundamental in how we look at mitzvahs in general, is there's the idea that the 613 mitzvahs are, are, count, are basically consists of two divisions. There's the mitzvah saseh, the positive commandments and the mitzvahs lo say the negative commandments. And uh, they are opposite the 248 limbs that a person has in their body and the 348 sinews that, can, that a person consists of. And according to Chazal, each part of our physical body has a spiritual counterpart. And the fulfillment of every mitzvah using our physical body that we were given rectifies these spiritual limbs that are represented in our neshama opposite our body, which means on a very practical level, on a very non-Kabbalistic practical level, if we're not fulfilling any particular mitzvah, it could have a real impact on one of the limbs of our body. And on the contrary, if we're filling them, then we're using our limbs the way Hashem intended for us to use them in service of Hashem. And that will bring the tikkun that's necessary to these spiritual counterparts. So now we can understand, wait a second, there's 613 mitzvahs, but how many of them can I not do? How many of them can only a Kohen do or a Levi do or a Yisrael do? So this makes it much easier to understand how it is that we could be getting to spiritual perfection in all of the limbs in our body, even though we can't physically carry out all the mitzvahs on our own. And I think... This gives also a, a beautiful new layer of understanding. Oh, that's the million dollar question. Okay, how do we know which mitzvah is connected to a certain body part? Well, if we knew, that would be really easy because we'd get sick. And instead of quarantining, you know, we'd be able to just pinpoint 
what mitzvah we need to rectify and it would be a very easy way to live life. I, I actually think that that would, that would potentially take away from our bechira, from our free will. It would be such an easy Judaism were we to just take it easy and whenever and, you know, some kind of sickness came up, we could just rectify that particular mitzvah. Um, notwithstanding that, there are, I have seen people talk about it, but most of the context in which they talk about it is them explaining why we don't know that. Which is interesting. I'm sure. I'm sure you find that interesting. But uh, but anyway, yeah. I wish. I wish that would be that would be amazing. So this gives a whole new level of meaning to the quote from Chazal. Again, another quote from Chazal: "Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelaze." All Jews are responsible for one another. So there are different applications of what that means: responsible for one another. There's certainly the idea that we are responsible to take care of one another, to do chesed with one another, but. I believe actually the source for this statement was referring to the spiritual health of our fellow Jew. Kal Yisrael Rebim Zelazeh means all Jews are spiritually responsible for one another. And when a Jew is not following the ways of the Torah, it has a negative influence on all of us as a Jewish people. And we have a responsibility to try to help our brothers and sisters to take the next step in their, in their spiritual connection. We all have a, a holy duty to help one another connect to Hashem, to help one another do mitzvahs. So that, you know, we can do that through uh, education or encouragement and a lot of love and, and a lot of goodwill. And I think this idea, kol Yisrael arevim zelazeh, is also... Uh, a, a nice understanding according to this, that we're all collectively fulfilling the mitzvah. So if somebody is not doing their mitzvah, that for sure has an impact on our, you know, degree of spiritual perfection. So, you know, sometimes we might wish we had the opportunity to do more mitzvahs. Don't we all wish we had more mitzvahs that we could, that we could do that perhaps don't apply to us. I'll give you a, a, a perfect example, I think, of a mitzvah, two mitzvahs, that cannot be done by men and women. So besides Kohen Levi and Yisrael, there are also different mitzvahs which are designated for men and some that are designated only for women. So here's, a, here's an example of that. I, I have in front of me a Sefer HaMitzvah, the Book of Mitzvahs, and we're going to do mitzvah 542 and mitzvah 543 out of the 613, okay? Mitzvah 542 is lo yia kli gever al isha. A man's apparel should not be upon a woman. It is a prohibition from the Torah for a woman to wear a man's clothing. We're going to get into a little bit of, of the technicalities of this mitzvah just for the sake of speaking it out and trying to understand it. So that's a mitzvah that only a woman can do. No man can do this mitzvah. Maybe a man will say, well, I want to be a woman because a woman has another mitzvah that I can't do. Well, that's wishful thinking because if you look at the next mitzvah, 543, and that is, isha, and a man shall not wear a woman's garment. So catch 22, there's no way out of this one. Uh, a single person cannot fulfill both of these mitzvahs. It is impossible for, for a person to fulfill both of these, you can only fill one of them. And, uh, you know, the idea, I guess, let's just get into in a very brief way, the, the background of what this entails. So a woman not putting on a man's uh, clothing is anything that is items that are exclusive to men. So that means clothing that only men would wear, adornments, weapons, anything that is worn exclusively by men. What does that mean? How do you determine that? You determine that by the region in which it is. So based on the custom of the local place, what men wear and what wom women wear, the woman would have a prohibition from wearing something that's exclusively for men. Interestingly, uh, Unculus, who translated the Torah into Aramaic, says the example that he says, it's not just an example, it's the translation of these words in the Torah is weapons of a man shall not adorn a woman. But it's not specific to weapons. It's also clothing or other things. So the Sefer HaMitzvah says that, that the verse only includes items, again, that are 
exclusively worn by men. If they're gender neutral, then they're not included in this prohibition. So Uncleus wanted to give us an example of something that is undisputed, nobody will disagree, is exclusively for use of men. And he couldn't think of a better example than weapons of war. He, a woman would not wear weapons of war, go out with a sword. So it's interesting, you know, I was thinking about that point and I was wondering if in this day and age, we would still say that a weapon is something that's exclusively used by men. Certainly there are women that have weapons. Certainly there are women in this day and age that are in the army as well. So I was trying to like think of whether that would be, you know, different due to the progression of man and how women, I'll get to your question in a moment, and how women mm -hmm. perhaps would uh, have a weapon now. But the truth is that I think the weapons of war are very different in the days of Uncleus than they are now. So for example, there are women who are in combat now, but I don't know of any you know, significant percentage in any place of women who would go out to war with a sword and cut their enemies with a, with a sword. Meaning our wars are not so gory as they used to be. I mean, of course they're, they're horrific, but, but the way that someone uses weapons of war is very different. So, you know, even now, even in armies that have women in combat, I think it is a relatively small percentage of women who would actually be in the front lines, you know, of a battle. But, not, but notwithstanding that, the, the guidelines of this mitzvah have to do with the custom in the place that people are living in. What is your question, Bonnie? I think it just clicked, but I was trying to think how we went from the building the Mishkan in transitioning into doing mitzvahs. But I think you started off by saying the Kohen couldn't do certain mitzvahs. Yeah, so and, we're just giving an, okay. exactly an example yeah, okay. of a mitzvah that not everybody could do, that, only, that are only exclusive to other people. And then I'm kind of getting mm -hmm. distracted here with telling you about this mitzvah. So I'm going to keep getting distracted for another three minutes because okay. I feel like once we opened up this can of worms, we should close it back up again and, <laughs> <laughs> and give a little bit of insight into this mitzvah um, to understand why there is such a mitzvah and, and what's wrong with you know, cross-dressing and, and why does the Torah frown on this. So I just want to read, and then we'll get right back to our topic here, the underlying purpose of the mitzvah. So the Sefer mitzvahs often will give us a glimpse at the reason why Hashem gives us mitzvahs. But he says in his introduction that this is not necessarily the one and only reason for the mitzvah, but it is a reason for the mitzvah. It could be that there are many of them, you know, but this is a perspective that he came across or perhaps he thought of on his own. Um, in this case, he actually quotes the Rambam, Maimonides, for giving this particular one. So the point is that this is just to give us a glimpse into the world of why Hashem gives us mitzvahs. So let's read this and then we'll get back to we'll get back to our topic. So among the underlying purposes of the mitzvah is to keep immorality away from our holy nation and thus to forbid any matter and any situation through which it is common for people to experience failure in that area. And this is along the lines of what our sages teach us as a metaphor that our God hates immorality, which is to say that out of his love for us, he distances us from immorality as it is a most ugly thing in his eyes. Furthermore, it grabs a man's heart and it makes him stray from a good path and a desirable mindset onto a bad path and a mindset of folly. The Torah therefore forbade not only acts of immorality, but even things that might lead to immorality. And there is no doubt that if men and women would wear similar clothing, it would lead to a situation where they would constantly mingle with each other and the land would be full of immorality. So by forbidding the genders from dressing like each other, even if it's only one article of clothing, the Torah is ensuring a separation between the genders and an atmosphere of purity and holiness. So I think that is a, a beautiful perspective and understanding why the Torah sets this guideline into place to try to keep that uh, separation and keep us as a holy nation and a holy people. So should we be jealous? Should a man be jealous that he can't do the mitzvahs of a woman and a woman that he can't do the mitzvahs of a man and a levy that he can't do of a Kohen and a Kohen that he can't do of a Yisrael? And the answer is no. The answer is that our mission was never to fulfill everything in the Torah. Our mission was only to do it collectively, 
with all our brothers and sisters. So we can take whatever was assigned to us. And that's what we're going to choose to run with. That's what, those are the mitzvahs we're going to try as hard as we possibly can to try and fulfill. And we're not going to feel bad about the fact that we're not doing something that was assigned to someone else, because that's not what Hashem wants us. That's not what Hashem wants from us in our mission towards fulfilling the Torah. And I think, I think there's another, another way of looking at this, and that is even within the mitzvahs that we can do. So the, the overwhelming majority of mitzvahs can be done by everybody. It's, it's minorities on, on either corner in different categories that are only for specific genders and Kohen uh, Levi Yisrael, et cetera. So there's of course different levels to which we could fulfill a mitzvah. We could do it a little, we could do it a lot, we could dedicate our whole life to it, but it's very unlikely that we're gonna be able to absolutely excel in a huge handful of different categories of mitzvahs. If we're excelling in Torah learning, for example, and that means we're the Gadol Hadar, we're the, we're the holy, the holy, holiest of people, the holiest of rabbis, and we're learning 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, we're studying Torah, we're doing the best you possibly can. Chances are there's other mitzvahs that are going to come at the expense of that. Maybe an example could be chesed. How much chesed can somebody do? How much can they help other people if they're sitting and learning Torah all day? Another important mitzvah is saving a life. Saving a life in Judaism is one of the most important things you could do in this world. So somebody who has a knack for the medical field, went through the schooling, got his practice, and is out there. He's a doctor. He's a paramedic. He's a first responder. He could literally be saving lives all day. I want to save lives all day. And I also want to learn Torah all day. And I also want to do chesed all day. But I can't. I can't do all of it. But the way we're going to reassure ourselves is that our job is to do what we have a, a knack for, a talent for, to push forward as much as we possibly can, but not to feel bad that somebody's excelling us in any particular area, because that's, you know, perhaps not our forte, our area where we're going to focus extra hard on. I do think, though, it's awesome for everybody to have something they specialize in whether that is chesed or that is helping people or it is learning Torah or it's prayer or it's any of the so many mitzvahs that are out there, you know, what's your specialty? What's your specialty? What do you excel in and, uh, you know, push a nice amount of your time and your focus on is uh, an important question, I think, to think about. Okay, let me just take a quick peek at the chat here and we'll move on to So, okay, so someone asked to, for a little bit of clarity on how not wearing a garment assigned to the other, on, on the prohibition to wear a garment that is primarily used or actually exclusively used by the other gender, how will that stop frivolous mingling between men and women? So the, the Sefer HaMitzvah was saying that by breaking down the separation of genders, it's more likely that people will mingle with one another. Um, I guess I, I can just give you my perspective a little bit on things that, you know, I don't know, in my small little bit of experience in the world, very often people who are specifically cross-dressing and going out of their way to, you know, choose their garments in a way that will, will be very openly a sign that, that they're wearing something different. Like a, a man who walks down the street in wearing lipstick is making a statement. And I think the statement that's being made often is one of immorality. So I understand how the Sefer Mitzvah says that not keeping that kind of separation leads to immorality because I, th I think that that's the reality that a lot of times what's being paraded around in that realm is of an immoral nature. Um, you know, just from, I guess, what I, what I see a little bit in the world. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, thank you. I, I just... You're breaking up a little, sorry. We're not talking about a woman wearing a hat or a woman wearing... We're not talking about simply a woman wearing pants or 
a, a button down shirt that may look like a man's shirt yeah, or, so or a man wearing a uh, colorful pink, you know, <laughs> or, or something like that. You're talking about specifically something that's flamboyantly the other gender. Yeah. So it's, it, there's two, two guidelines here. One is it's exclusively the other gender. And the other is that, that it's exclusively the other gender in the area in which you're living, in, in the place that you are. So if there's a region in the world where pants are never worn by women, I don't know if there is, you know, but if there is, then that would be something that's exclusively man. I mean, for sure in Western society, that's not the case. Um, but by the way, think back to thousands of years ago and men were wearing robes and, and skirts. So you know, everything depends on the time and the time and place in which we're living. That's the guidelines for it. Yeah. So you can see how if it's something Thank exclusive you. to the other gender, it's probably there to make a statement that's that's against Torah values. And even if it isn't, the Torah is worried that it will lead to that. So that's a little bit of the underlying reasoning behind that mitzvah. Okay, so what else do we have time to get into? Let's get into one more idea. That was all the Aron. We're now, we're going through different um, of the utensils and items that were in the Mishkan and talking about lessons that we could learn from it. So here's a fascinating one. Um, here's a fascinating one about the menorah. And this is primarily something I saw in the Kedusha Slevi. He's, uh, you know, he was a Hasidic Rebbe. And uh, I don't know, I, f I find it fascinating. So I figured let's, let's share it with you. So he talks about how the idea of lighting the menorah that's talked about in, in this week's parsha and Truma represents elevating the mundane for service of Hashem. We're taking oil, we're taking something super physical and we're lighting a fire on it. And that's used for the purpose of connecting with Hashem, of serving Hashem and uh, and that's the idea that's represented there. He also talks about, I don't want to get into it because probably mainly because I didn't understand it so well, but that the flowers, the menorah had a very complex and beautiful design to it. And one of the stages of it was flowers. Near the bottom of the base, there were flowers. And he talks about how flowers in a way represents love, um, which I guess everybody would agree that flowers represents love. So I'm pretty sure that's not the way he intended it. <laughs> I don't think he was so uh, like surface level in that realm, but he talks about love. So let's talk about love a little bit. He says, there are three types of love. One type is the love for something that is forbidden, something that we're not allowed to have that is, that is prohibited by the Torah. Another type of love is for something that is permitted. There's no prohibition to love food, for example. And the third type of love and the ultimate most holy purpose of love is love of Hashem. The way that we can love Hashem, avas Hashem. So he says, love is an extremely powerful emotion. I don't need to tell you that. Who knows how many trillions of dollars of industry in, in the modern era are revolving around love. So it's an extremely powerful emotion. But the reason it's here is for its ultimate use, which is love that is channeled to Hashem. So he says, when we take a mundane version of love and we channel it towards loving Hashem, that is a way that we can take something mundane and elevate it to the spiritual. So he says, every mida, every character trait in this world was given to us ultimately for the purpose of using in our service of God. So he says, awakening that emotion could be difficult. So I, I guess let's talk about love. You can't make yourself feel lovey. Okay, that's not a thing. Like I wanna love Hashem right now, so I'm just gonna love Hashem right now. Love is an emotion, it needs to be brought out. So. Sometimes the emotion of love is awakened within us because of something around us, because of somebody we see, because of our spouse, because of some food that gets us excited, who knows what. So he says at that opportunity, at that time, we have an opportunity to take this character trait, which we just awakened and direct it and reroute it 
towards our love of Hashem. Now, how in the world do we do that? That's, that sounds cool, but, <laughs> but how in the world does that happen? So, so the short answer, unfortunately, is there's no magic formula in how that could happen. But he talks about a few ways that one could consider trying to make this happen. So for example, maybe at the time that that emotion is awakened in with you, you can think to yourself, what is this emotion I'm feeling now? I'm feeling a love for, a desire for, a fat, juicy steak. So think that through. If someone could feel such a strong emotion for something that is so temporary, you know, let's say if it's food, food is as temporary as it could possibly be. You stop enjoying it as soon as you swallow it and you stop being satisfied by it as soon as you're hungry again and you pass it through and that's it. It's done and it never comes back again. If we can awaken within us such a feeling for something so physical, how much more so do we have within us the capacity to love Hashem in a burning level so much deeper than a shallow kind of love? Because it's something that's permanent. It's something, it's a spiritual connection that will enhance our world now. It'll enhance our reward in the world to come. And that's how we can like awaken this and channel it towards it. Um, Maybe somebody could think of, you know, what are the ways Hashem loved me? Like I'm experiencing this emotion of love now. Well, when can I think of a time that I experienced Hashem's love for me? Maybe that can awaken a love within him. I think ultimately there's no easy way, but I guess I, I challenge you to try this. <laughs> I challenge you to try this. Next time you feel an emotion that is bad, okay? Not, not talking about a general emotion. That one is... Let, let's say it's somebody, we have a temptation for something bad, any kind of emotion, okay? So that could mean somebody is, you know, feeling very angry and aggressive or confrontational, any kind of Mida character trait within us, try to take a pause and think, how can I redirect this feeling somehow towards service of Hashem? And he says, I want to read, read for you a little. It's so interesting. He says, Let's say you'll have a person who will, I'm, I'm reading from the Kedusha Slavi now, I'm reading the Hebrew, but I'm going to translate it out loud. So you have a tzaddik, you have a good person, and some kind of external thought breaks into his head. Some kind of love that is, that is foreign, that's not, that's not good. He's loving something he shouldn't. So there's two approaches. There's a person who pushes the thought out of his head, and there's a person who grabs onto this thought flips it 180 degrees and finds a way to service Hashem with it. So you have a bad love. You have a love for something you're not supposed to be, you know, attracted to or thinking about. I'm going to switch that into a love of Hashem, of the creator of the world. And you're going to say, you know, if I could have, if I could feel in something so temporary and illusionary, I could feel a love for how much more so can I use that emotion of love to love Hashem? So what's the difference between these two approaches? The one who pushed the thought out of his head, he didn't gain anything from it. He had something that was interrupting him. Let's say he's praying and all of a sudden some, some silly distraction comes in his mind that he's, you know, something he shouldn't be thinking about. So if he just pushes out of his mind. Did he grow from that experience? No. But if he grabs it and finds a way to flip it and, and channel it to Hashem, so then he took something that was a sin, and he turned it into the mitzvah. And there's nothing greater than we could do in this world than take something so low and so mundane and sinful and find a way to actually take that and use it for Avodah Sashem. And that's a pretty powerful idea. The, the comparison I thought of, and we'll end with this, we'll take any questions or comments, is I had a rabbi in Israel, and one of the things that he did a lot of times before we like started learning, which is by the way, a pretty uh, incredible way of clearing your mind to be able to concentrate in learning is he would lead a meditation session for a few minutes. We'd all meditate five, six, seven minutes, or sometimes only two or three. And he would like guide us in this meditation. And one of the things he was trying to teach us is what do you do if you have distractions while you're meditating? It happens all the time. If you're meditating, you know, unless you're deep in the forest, but probably even if you're there, there are going to be things that are begging for your attention. It could be something physical. It could be a truck rolling by or birds chirping or all kinds of noises that could come up. 
Or it could be your own mind driving you nuts and bringing all kinds of random, uninvolved thoughts into your brain. The most frustrating one is, you know, your mind saying, could you relax already? Stop thinking, you know, like your, your own mind tells you that. You ever have that when you're trying to fall asleep, you're like, just want to fall asleep already. And your mind is driving you out, you know, driving you crazy. So he says, trying to fight that head on is, is a recipe for disaster. Because the more you think about it, the more it's there and the harder it is to get the thought away. So he said, I feel like a similar approach. He said, take the thought, don't fight the thought. You are not going to win that battle. Take it and bring it into your meditation. So what does that mean? I don't know. Let's say you're, you're thinking, you're thinking you're meditated, you're calm and you hear the noise of a truck rolling by and it's going really, really slow and it's making so much noise. So instead of trying to push it away, we're going to say, okay, there's a truck passing by and it's noisy and it's annoying and it's not letting me concentrate, but I'm just, I'm going to let the truck stay there and I'm not going to try to control it. And you could just engage with yourself in this kind of dialogue Take the distraction and find a way to incorporate it into the process that you're trying to do. So I feel like that's uh, that's the way I understood this Caduceus Levy. We have something that's distracting us. Instead of trying to fight it head on, let's try to incorporate it into our service of Hashem. However, we could do that. Again, I encourage you to all try it on your own. Let me know how it goes and uh, see how powerful a tool this could be for all of us.